this is Auteur de Tour, wherein three film lovers travel through the filmographies of cinema's most important directors in hopes of finding a greater understanding on the other side. Welcome back to another episode of Auteur Detour. I'm Chris Balaza, joined as always by Ian Hinckley. Hello. And Travis White. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> uh, I love every time we have a stupid fucking hello. That was got to happen. No, I know. But I like <laughs> All right. <it. laughs> staple. Today we'll be diving into The Big Lebowski, the seventh feature film from writer-director duo Joel and Ethan Cohen. Released in 1998, The Big Lebowski centers around one Jeffrey Lebowski, known as The Dude, a laid-back, white Russian-drinking, middle-aged bachelor and avid bowler from Los Angeles, who one day finds himself embroiled in a case of mistaken identity and surrounded by a cast of odd and colorful characters. When The Dude has his home mistakenly broken into and beloved rug micturated upon by goons out to collect a debt from a different, unrelated Lebowski... He's unwittingly cast into a world of nihilists, porn stars, cowboys, private detectives, and eclectic vaginal artwork. Lured by the promise of replacing a soiled rug, the dude is enlisted by the Big Lebowski to deliver a ransom to the kidnappers of his porn star trophy wife, which leads to enough double crosses, setups, plot twists, and unexpected encounters to rival even the most confounding Raymond Chandler novel. Through it all, the dude takes on each plot turn one white Russian at a time, all in the name of his beloved rug. Because anyone who's seen it can agree on one thing. It sure did tie the room together. What do you think, guys? Uh, I love this movie so much. And it's been so much more after this week. I mean, I literally, like, this is a movie I saw three times in the theater. I saw it opening night. And then left not loving it, which is, I think, most people's experience with it. Where I kind of, you know, there were sequences of it that I loved, but it was just too much to, you know, I didn't let it wash over me. It was too much to try to follow. I was confused. Went home, told my dad all about it. It was just like, this is a fucking movie. And then like went back with him the next day and then saw it again like the following week. I just loved it. I've seen it high. I've seen it drunk. I've seen it with watch alongs where we're saying every line. And like, then it's been probably eight years since the last time I put it on, maybe seven years. And it had kind of faded in my mind as like how good it was. And it was just the lines that stuck with me. And then this week I put it on on Wednesday, smiled the whole fucking way through it, then watched Inherent Vice the following day because I'm like, I want to live in this world. And then on Saturday I put it on again and watched it all the way through again. I just loved it. I thought it was so fun. (laughs) Travis? <laughs> I like it too. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, one of their best movies. Uh, really fun to watch. Yeah. That's all. <laughs> I love it. This is probably the second Coen Brother movie I ever saw, and I actually watched it in college a few years after it had come out. And uh, I remember just being so confused the very first time I saw it because, like, you know, maybe it was the intoxicants speaking or the fact that the plot is just so convoluted and so many different things going on with so many different unrelated characters that uh, I didn't get it, but I knew that I liked it. And like, wow, that was really fun. I didn't get it all. But does it matter? And I think that's kind of the point in the end. Uh, Does it all really even matter? You know, Um, but this is one of my absolute favorite Cohen movies now. And I've probably seen it, you know, countless times more than likely any other of their films. So uh, excited to be talking about this one today. Um, Well, I mean, where do we even start with this movie? Because it is like a movie that the plot is hard to really wrap your mind around because it's like, you know, it's almost just a way for you to live in his uh, philosophy and in his brain. You know? Let's start, if we can, at the beginning. What I love about this movie is it's the first line of the movie is out in the West, and it's spoken <laughs> by a cowboy. <laughs> I know. And there's a Western, like a very old fashioned Western song playing um, about a tumbleweed that you literally see on screen. And then um, as the music kind of reaches its first like crescendo, you the the camera like, you know, um, 
gets to the top of this kind of like hill that's covered in like that could be just on the prairie right like or on the mm-hmm. uh, like uh mm-hmm. in the old west and then you see sort of like these kind of starlights of the kind of like sprawl of los angeles circa 1991 and that's what i mean that's what stands out to about this movie to me is that it's like in, we've talked about the way that other Coen Brothers movies kind of mash up kind of like genres and tropes and kind of like remix them and like put them in like kind of the wrong time period and stuff like that and this is the like almost like the um, the logical conclusion of that it's just like the most extreme version of that um, yeah well I think like what hit me this time that had never really hit me before was like how much of this was um, their, it was like their L.A. movie. You know, it's like in the way that they're like, Fargo is so distinctly Fargo and uh, um, Blood Simple is so distinctly Texas and Raising Arizona is like Arizona, clearly. You know, like they do these things that are like, Mm -hmm. like we've always said about them. Like it's important that they have their place and even they say in the intro like he's a man for his place yeah but like the entirety of this movie is so like a skewering of LA not even a skewering but just like a farcical like LA where it's like everybody's so over the top LA which I had never really put together before until watching them all in sequence and like they had done obviously Barton Fink which was in LA but like this was like you know not modern LA, but relatively yeah. modern LA, and like and Barton Fink was more like a Hollywood movie. This is more like right. uh, yeah, just like an LA, like the outskirts. But like all the scenes that like the Jackie Treehorn stuff and all that stuff, where it was just like, oh, this is like so funny to me now. Like seeing like these Midwestern guys like taking on LA in this way, like I just loved it so much. I don't know. It's like three. It's only two, three or four shots, maybe that. Um, comprise of the introduction of Jackie Treehorn, you know, that slow motion sequence that goes into um, the regular frame rate at the very, very end. And the, like the woman bouncing on the trampoline or being th- yeah. flung by a trampoline <laughs> and uh, to the music of like Ima Sumac or whatever. Um, such an incredible sequence. I remember the first time I saw the movie, that sequence, like, again, it's very short and just a couple shots, but it stood out to me well, so much. And for it's me, so like, powerful. Yeah, it was that same sequence that you were saying, that tumbleweed, that like, even the first time I saw it when I was so, like, not sure what I was getting into, and then also not really all the way on board the whole time, it was literally like that sequence, just instant smile on my face where I'm just like, this is incredible. Like, when it pans over and you see that it's overlooking LA, you know, it's like... And, it's uh, really incredible. No, speaking of that specific scene, I think it actually kind of is a, a, a small comment and like foreshadowing of the whole rest of the movie it kind of sets up everything in that you're looking at basically what the whole movie's about are these two completely different worlds that coexist side by side. So, I mean, you have the world of like what looks like the prairie and the, the Western comes out and it's like this giant sprawl of like urban city Los Angeles. You've got the dude who exists in this world of like his own world of hippies and the flower power movement, you know, juxtaposed by like the Reagan administration with his poster of Nixon, you know what I mean, right. on his wall with a bowling ball. You've got Walter, who exists in his Vietnam like world, you know, while living in this like modern times that doesn't like you know accommodate or bend at all to his will. He's just you know in his own world of sorts. It's like so many different worlds that coexist next to one another, um, but yeah, all like within a self-contained bubble, like a lot of these Coen Brothers films tend to be. Well, I thought it was yeah. interesting. Yeah, they do all live in their own world, and like Jeff Bridges, like. They all live in like their their past glories too, or their past like defining moments. Um, when the dude has to like describe himself, he immediately goes back to like the two th- times that he's sort of like, yeah, yeah, and, like I don't know. Um, and then yeah, basically has nothing to say about anything that he's doing nowadays except for bowling. I think that was also like a deliberate. I mean, specifically like him not the Coen Brothers deliberately didn't um, give you much backstory on him. Uh, in in other versions of the script, they had a big backstory for him and how he was going to be like the heir to the Rubik's Cube fortune and like all this different stuff, you know? And then they just like, as it got made, you know, because it took years to make, but as it was getting closer, they just kept all that stuff. And like the only thing that they kept was like the Seattle 12 thing, which was like based on the guy who actually they, you know, based most of his character on Jeff Dowd, their friend, who's like a, you know, 
Hollywood sort of uh, agent or producer or something. I don't even know who he is, but he's actually a member of the Seattle seven as well, I think. Or Seattle seven. That's what I meant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But yeah, so it was like, um, I don't know. I think uh, him not having a backstory to me, this is like, you know, there's, I'm not going to go the whole move like podcast with no criticisms of it, but like for now, this is like their most, we were talking about in raising Arizona, like finding the positive positivity in their work and like how I found it more hard to um, be okay with in their movies. Cause they're so cynical usually. And like how, it left me a little bit wanting in Raising Arizona, like watching them try to be like, hey, but the world can be okay sometimes, you know? Like it just doesn't sit right in my mouth with the Coen Brothers movie. But in this movie, like the dude is just like the ultimate in Zen. Like it's really like, you know, that's what the whole movie is to me. It's just like how do all of these people show themselves like around this guy who's just like the ultimate and like the rolling tumbleweed. Like he'll just keep on going. Like that's the whole thing with him. And like, it does leave me positive. Like it's maybe the only movie that you're just like, yeah, like it's going to be okay. (laughs) You know, at the end of it. (laughs) The only movie in their filmography. (laughs) That's Mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah, Like that's the whole thing with me, like doing, like wanting to do this is trying to figure out like, what are they trying to say? Mm Mm-hmm with all of their movies. And like, this is the only time that they do try to have like a positive. Cause you know, Hudsucker proxy does it a little bit. Raising Arizona does it a little bit, mm-hmm. but like, this is the only one that I'm like, Oh, like, yeah. Like I feel it at the end where I'm just like, yeah, it's going to be okay. <laughs> like there's a little dude coming around. There's a little Bowski coming around the corner too, you know, <laughs> right. like, we're going to be all right. I think too, it's, interesting in this movie because after each crazy scene no matter who he encounters he just goes back to his normal life again and then the next thing just falls right into his lap right he never actively seeks out any of this stuff it all just falls right onto him like you know fuck it dude let's go bowling after like the you know motorcyclist is right off of what they think is his you know with his dirty laundry (laughs) or whatever you know and then it's just like reset 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 so at the end it feels natural that like yeah that's it like really all he was looking for was his rug that's really the only thing and his whole uh, thing is resolved almost immediately in the very beginning of the movie, right? But then, you know, he's called on to do X, Y, and Z, and then this and that falls into his lap. So, uh, yeah, I think it makes more sense that the end is, um, you know, kind of tied up neatly because his life is just basically tied up neatly. He lives the dream in his own way, you know? And so there's not much out there that's really going to truly uh, affect that, and it doesn't in the end. Yeah, I mean, you brought up, like, how, you know, this is another movie I brought up Inherent Vice earlier because, you know, it's such a clear, um, I don't know, parallel of this movie because like they're both movies where like a stoner is trying to find a missing woman who's not really missing. And he's just going through episodic sort of adventures with people trying to discover this mystery that doesn't actually exist, you know? And like that as a, um, construct, I don't know, like, the construct of the movie is very Raymond Chandler, like you mentioned in the intro and like, that's what they were going for. But like the idea behind like trying to solve a mystery that doesn't actually exist also, you know, like, like you said, like he's not really like actively trying to solve it as much as things just keep falling in his lap. And that's similar to what happens in a lot of Chandler movies and stuff too. But like, I don't know. I do like, it is one of those things that makes the rewatch of it. So like, um, rewarding is that it's just like, you know, there's once you realize that none of it matters, like he's literally just going through this shit. It's like, it just makes it so fun for me. I don't know. You know, there was something that always stuck out to me in the movie that I never, I never understood like what the significance of was of the, uh, like George HW Bush and like Saddam Hussein being in, in the movie, aside from like, um, you know, setting it in that kind of time period, right. like the early 90s. And I was thinking this time as I watched it, the just the like the image of Lebowski getting yanked out of one limousine and like thrown into another one, like at the bidding of these like wealthy, powerful people. Mm-hmm. I mean, even though uh, the big Lebowski is not 
doesn't actually have a job, doesn't actually have any money, but mm-hmm. it, you know, just because of his like um, proximity to power and, and wealth, you know, he can manipulate people, have like a manservant, you know, all this stuff, have a trophy wife. Um, I was thinking about just the way that poor people and the people that are sort of on the you know outskirts of society are like manipulated by like wealthy people and the people in power and George H W Bush being like we have to you know this aggression will not stand we have to like invade Iraq which was like of course like um you know he's like a rich oil tycoon and yeah. you know and has like CIA ties going back possibly like 50 years and like has his own mm-hmm. reasons for wanting things to happen and he's like kind of manipulating the country into this um, uh, military endeavor, like at the same time that all this stuff is happening to Lebowski. I thought that was uh, significant. Like maybe that they're trying to make a, like a parallel there. That's kind of how I read it. You know, the whole thing with like, um, you know, he talks about all these like significant, like, um, you know, movements that he's been a part of and stuff like that when he's in bed with Maud. But like when Big Lebowski says, like, the bums lost, you know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. his movement did lose. Like, he seems like the last, you know, Chris, you called him, like, a flower child. But he doesn't exist in a world with, like, other hippies. He's sort of, like, the last one in this, like, you know, tiny little apartment where, like, he's just sort of found himself with, like, you know, Steve Buscemi's character, who who basically has no context in the movie. Like, uh, and then uh, John Goodman, who seems to be, like, if not pro war, like he's definitely oh, he's definitely been he like warped. Pro-war. He's definitely been warped by the like his experience, like as you know, in Vietnam and stuff like that. And yeah, mm-hmm. to me, it's like the George H. W. Bush stuff is like this is going to happen again. This is just it's just happening again. Like you know, and that's what's interesting about like setting the Chandler uh, story like in modern times to or contemporary times is that it's like it, these things you know, rich people manipulating you know people who don't have power like for their own bidding is a timeless tale. I agree. I think like, you know, I mean, I mentioned this briefly like earlier, but, uh, or, you know, earlier in the week, but like, I do think that like a huge part of this movie is their, you know, critique of wealth and money in general and how money like, uh, fucks with people, like every different kind of person. And like the only person that doesn't seem to have any con concept of like needing or wanting money is the dude and you know i guess donnie too like donnie is a weird character that we should try to get into although i have no take on donnie like i really don't like even like for years my take on donnie was just like oh this is in reaction to fargo because steve buscemi in his last movie was like a guy who wouldn't shut the fuck up and so now it's just like shut the fuck up (laughs) you know like that's like how i saw it now this time I was trying to think of like what they were trying to say with Donnie and I don't really know, but we can get into that later, I guess, if we go through the characters a little bit more. But uh, as far as the money thing goes, like that is a huge part of it. And also, you know, not just money, but like, like you said, like the sort of war machine or the American, like uh, the American capitalist, like thing that we've got going on and how like everybody sort of, bounces that off of the dude and it's just like is reflected so wildly you know it's like you find out over the course of the movie that the big Lebowski like is broke like you said and like doesn't have anything but he's like you know this ultimate like and he's even got Brant you know the Philip Seymour Hoffman character that's like wants to be him and is like his little Smithers guy and it's like I don't know it's so and then Walter like immediately being like our, you know, they, they aren't going to do this to us and our like fucking car and all this stuff where he's just like immediately like co-opting the money that is like the dudes, if it's anybody's mm-hmm. like, I don't know, everything about it is like going back to that for me, like with this watch of just like, oh, like we're just like watching them critiquing like American capitalist society, like by bouncing it off of the ultimate Zen man, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's, I mean, speaking of Walter, maybe we can talk about him a little bit because it's so fun. I remember the first time I saw this movie, John Goodman's character just totally jumps right out at you. And it's weird because you have the zen of the dude with the like overly aggressive, like market zero, you're entering a world of pain of Walter, you know what I mean? <laughs> just stuck in his world of Vietnam and and everything. And I hadn't, I didn't know who John Milius was at the time when I first watched this film, mm-hmm. but it's so cool. <laughs> if you just look at a picture of John Milius and hold it up next <laughs> to John Goodman's character in this movie, it's like, wow, that's 
that's a pretty good uh, <laughs> that's a pretty good likeness. Uh, John Millis, of course, uh, directed Red Dawn and, and wrote a couple other films yeah. as well. Um, but uh, Apocalypse yeah. Now. Apocalypse Now, right, right. Um, but yeah, uh, <laughs> John it's Goodman's Gidman's favorite so movie that he's ever made. Like, and you get why. Like, it looks. I don't know. This that was another thing I got. This watch was like maybe you guys had already felt like this, but I was like, oh, this is Goodman's movie too. Like, it's really like a two-hander in a lot of ways. Like, I had always thought of him as being like as tertiary a character as like, you know, any of the side characters. But I'm like, oh, this is really like a two-hander of them. Like, it's a buddy movie with the two of them, you know? Like, and it's really, I loved him in this movie so much. He's amazing. I mean, of, you know, what I know of like, because I've always been just kind of like mildly aware of like the cult of this movie. Like I don't have any like best friends necessarily who are like obsessive about this movie to the degree that like some people can be, you know. Uh, but you know, from what I've heard of people, like whenever the conversation comes up around this movie, it's always John Goodman's lines that people are quoting. It's like his character that people are like mm-hmm. fascinated by. Um, yeah, he is a great, great character performed to like with absolute like uh i don't know uh with with bravado by john goodman he's perfect in the movie as opposed to you know steve buscemi's character where i think honestly his character is chet in uh barton fink stands out more than his character of donnie uh maybe that's just me (laughs) partly because really if you think about it in big lebowski uh donnie's character never really has his own he's literally either parroting or like commenting on someone else's statement right so he doesn't really have his own monologue or any of that stuff he just exists he's almost literally in the background you know uh every time he's around so uh yeah uh you know um he's clearly like a, a member of their crew and they they feel for him when he dies you know what i mean but uh yeah it's funny how a guy can go from his character in fargo you know steve buscemi's just like unforgettable to uh, admittedly i almost forgot who played him like years ago when i saw it like one of the first times i almost forgot steve buscemi <laughs> was in the movie because he's you know just such a background character totally. uh but yeah, there's talk about the just depths of, of, of character and writing and the things that stand out to you, you know, John Goodman's larger than life. And then Donnie's just this like, you know, because that's the up. weird thing about Donnie is that like, you know, normally when you would have like a put upon like or a guy that's in the friend group where the, the more, um, you know, when the John Goodman type is going to just shut him down every time he starts to talk, which is basically what his character is here. You would have like a sad sack. You'd have like a guy who looks beaten down and weak, but Donnie just looks so like the way Steve Buscemi plays him. He just looks so unaffected by it. And like, you know, he's not, that's not what would happen if any three of us got told to shut the fuck up once, you know what I mean? Let alone like over and over and over and over again. It's like, it's a bizarre performance in a bizarre role that I don't know how it plays into the like movie other than that. It's like, you know, there's a, it's a good way to just have a funny guy that like, you can say shut the fuck up to all the time. Well, it's a, you know, you guys were talking about like the lack of kind of context about who the, like the dude's backstory, like how these characters like came together. You know what I mean? It just like, it makes sense that these three fit together. Like, you know, you couldn't like John Goodman unloads on several other people in the movie and it's like a big deal. And they like, there's a mm-hmm. huge confrontation about it because Donnie can take the abuse. It seems like he's just kind of like fine with having that role in the group, you know? Yeah, yeah he, like you get the idea that they may have like I don't know something might have brought them together, but they they do have like a weird like a perfect balance the triangle or of the literally that like they you know Walter's personality has just driven away everybody else at the bowling alley except for the most Donnie chill the guy game. in the world and then the most yeah. like kind of obliviously <laughs> cheerful yeah <laughs> totally exactly yeah. like um, you know when Walter comes after like the old hippie guy <laughs> you know the guy who had like the conscientious objector yeah like. That's like the moment of that where mm-hmm. you see like how other people react yeah. to Walter's energy. He looks you know? like he's about to cry. Yeah. He's like, <laughs> he's just looking at the dude being like, dude, come on. Like, I'm just, I'm not going to mark it. Mark it. It's like, it's so good. Mark it zero. That image of John Goodman pulling the gun on him is like so funny and so iconic. Uh, just John Goodman's face like throughout this movie just cracks me up. Like I see a still image of him and I just like want to laugh. He's incredible. Yeah, absolutely. 
uh, talk up. I just keep thinking of Torturo, who's one of our favorites, I think. Uh, and it's <laughs> yeah. just unbelievable. This performance is just one of those that you will never get out of your head, even though he, he could, the movie could exist without him completely, but he just is so unforgettable, you know? Uh, I guess even, well, you made, they made a, a movie or he made his own movie about Jesus or yeah. whatever the Jesus <laughs> rolls or whatever you're telling you me about. It? Oh my no, God. I've Ian, it, it came Ian. across my it? feed. But I will. I mean, we I can do a separate I, podcast on the Jesus on Jesus rolls because I could talk about okay. it for an hour. It's we <laughs> shouldn't. It's terrible. It's truly terrible. It's mind blowing that like of all of the characters that John Turturro has played, because I guess there was a little bit of like hurt feelings with this movie because he signed on to do it. He thought he was going to have a bigger part, and then like after you know it was being made he's like oh i've got like three minutes of screen time playing a pederast and i'm like you know like i mean i guess he knew that part but he didn't realize that like it was going to play nothing into the movie other than a joke really you know and like he does such an incredible job he added so much i mean not just to like the bowling alleys vibe which is like a very la joke in a lot of ways but also just like you know, he, like, danced like Muhammad Ali. Like, that was all him. Like, all that, like, his whole performance was him. And it's incredible. And, like, so anyway. so He then moves he's like a cartoon it. character. He dances like the cartoon of the Slim Jim from those commercials, like, years ago. <laughs> like, his physicality in that role with his, like, pelvic thrusts. It's yeah. one of the most incredible things I've ever seen. And, like, directed, <laughs> like, with such beauty and precision. That musical number uh, is yeah. one of my favorite things, like, in cinema and yeah a great performance and yet uh like peter dinklage in game of thrones can't actually do the accent of the uh right. ethnicity that he's <laughs> playing uh which just somehow doesn't hurt it at all though but that's why it's like mind-blowing to me that like well i mean i guess what happened was he was mad he was not mad but he was kind of bummed that his character wasn't a bigger part of the movie and for years he was like i want to make this you know Jesus movie, which is really weird when you consider like Jesus is a terrible character. Actors are weird, right? and you can't do the and you can't do the accent. But like that aside, I mean, he's got the character down enough that he could do it. And so I watched this movie, and he directed it and stars in it with Audrey Tatu and Bobby Cannavale, and it's fucking the worst movie of the year. Like it really is. It came out last year. I guess it came out in Italy like three years ago. It played at some festival and went there, but never got released here until 2020. Yeah, I remember reading about and it years like, ago. And I was, yeah. Yeah. But then, so it's like a sex farce, which by the way, you're having a fucking sex farce with a guy who we know humped children, <laughs> you know? And they like play that off at the beginning and they, you know, he's not trying to be a good guy in it. Like, he's clearly a bad guy the whole movie. But I don't know. We don't have to get into we it We shouldn't too get much. too far into it. It we is a remake want. of, like, a notorious French uh, movie yeah, that, like, think, yeah. it, like, is more explicitly about, like, rapists and stuff like that. And they, I think they kind of toned down some of that for Like, the best the part Jesus of version. it really was just, like, Audrey Tattoo is great. John Turturro is great. I could give a shit about Bobby Cannaval, but he does fine, whatever. Like, they're all good in it, but, like... What is with fucking, Bobby Cannaval? Why is that I guy, like, like a beloved actor by so many auteurs? Like, in high places. All right, <laughs> that explains it. it. But I, I feel like I've that seen a couple movies it. where it's, like, where he's great, and then I feel like a lot of movies where he just falls flat. Or they, keep try, they kept trying to put him on TV shows for a while, and I was like, what? Why? Why am I watching this guy? I'm guessing he's just one of those guys that, like, everybody likes, you in know, real everybody life. wants around. Because mm. he's got, like, I don't know, he always plays relatively the same kind of guy, which seems like it'd be, like, a fun guy to have around, maybe. Yeah, he's pretty, he was kind of cool in The Station Agent. That was another Peter yeah, Dinklage joint. Mm -hmm. Anyway. I'm kind of, speaking of anyway. cast, it's kind of odd that given so many um, amazing characters and just ways that like different of their recurring actors were able to just kind of have a little bit of fun with this one. It's kind of amazing that Frances McDormand doesn't appear in this one, even I for like a second. Uh, I mean, she could have had like a tiny little role as like, I don't know, literally anything. And, and she's not in it at all, which is really, a, I thought, kind of an interesting, you know, little point. Maybe there's just enough characters in it already, but maybe there was something else. You know, she's like, I'll, I'll sit this one yeah. out. I mean, it's mostly surprising because he was in the works for so long. Like, they'd been working on the movie for so long, and she'd been in, you know, 
Has she been in every one of their movies up to this point? No, uh, she wasn't in uh, Miller's. Wait. She was, was one she of the was secretary in one of those movies. I don't know if it was Miller's Crossing or one it of them. Might have been she might have been. She might have been. Um, I don't. No, there wait, aren't that many. Was. There aren't that many. <laughs> anyway. There aren't that many uh, female roles in this movie. That's true. I was going to say. Right. I mean, that's. Right. I mean, that's the main. So you know, I mentioned I'm not going to be glowing about this movie the entire podcast. Like, if we want to start getting into that, I still want to get into more of the plot and like things that happen in it. But like. That is the biggest criticism I have with the movie what? is that like that there's no black people in L.A. in 1990. There are two. Wait a minute. Like I, 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 you know, I took this into account when I watched the movie because you guys have been talking about this, and there are two black people in L.A., which statistically is, is accurate. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. No, no, no. But it is a very small. It is a very small world in this movie, and there are. I don't there, think there, it there, is. Uh, there's like there's like LA. ten characters in this movie. Uh, strong disagree. There's so many characters mm, in this movie. Not really. Like that, that populate like everywhere from the bowling alley to the grocery stores mm. to Jackie Treehorn's party. To, there's like, not that every- many people in the grocery store. I think there's like one. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure I'm fully on board with this critique, but because uh, the black taxi cab driver. Is memorable. He does hate the fucking Eagles. That's he right. Yeah. The, no, he likes the Eagles, which is also... <laughs> oh, I mean, he hates... He, he that, hates his you know, outfit. Right, he loves the Eagles. You have one black guy in the movie, and he's the one who likes the Eagles? Come now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see a problem with that. <laughs> I'm just saying. Statistically, if we're talking statistics... In, no any, I want to sleep with you in the desert tonight. Yeah. <laughs> that, guy, that guy's outfit and everything, like it seemed, it seemed believable that he would like the Eagles. I, I thought that was a cool character. Oh, my God. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a world of men. Like, if, like I just, you know, the, the, that bowling alley and the porn party, like I just don't yeah. see like a lot of like women in these, in these uh, locales. To me, it, it kind of made sense. And again, the, the Coen brothers have a lot of strong female characters. They do have a lot of, uh, in their other movies, like it kind of makes sense to me that this one is more male centric. I was, I mean, I think when it comes to like the women, I mean, I'm still not done talking about how there's no black people there because there's not, you're wrong. But, um, uh, and there's. I'm wrong about two. Because <laughs> who's the second one? The, oh, the cop. cop. The cop. The cop. Right. So the white, the, the insanely white things of being like, you know, the, the Eagles thing, the Eagles loving uh, guy and being a cop are like the two. Non- Wait, being a cop is not an insanely white thing. Google statistics of like how many black people are cops. I think there's actually a, quite a bit. All right. Fine. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, OK, but as far as the women go, I, I know what you're saying. Like, I think that like especially the bowling alley, like this is an incredibly like especially the way that the bowling alley is in the movie is like the most like I don't know I don't want to say like homoerotic but it's just like a like man like it's where they're all going to be like their fucking dude men selves you know which also like I've bowled I've I've been to bowling alleys there's plenty of women in bowling alleys including in bowling leagues like that's like that's not not yeah not in the world of this movie yeah but not in this movie like it's it's there to represent them just like fully like embracing like this like you know it's funny talking to you guys right now about this because I was thinking earlier this week about how like if you have like three you know 38 year old dudes like that's generally the the like the the cliche would be that like they don't talk to each other they don't like sit around and just like talk about their feelings and stuff like that but like when we record a podcast like I talk to you guys for an hour and a half and we'll like span like our philosophies and our feelings and our like emotion. I feel like this is our like bowling alley in Big Lebowski where we can actually just like sit down and like talk about it. You know what I mean? Which is kind of funny and like kind of like gross in a weird way that it's not, I mean, it's not gross, but it's like, it's just like, it pointed out to me how funny it is to be like, no, if you put a microphone in front of us, then yeah, we'll just pour our fucking <laughs> talking out, you know, whereas like, 
how often during the week are you sitting down and talking for an hour and a half about like your philosophy on something? So you're saying this whole podcast, this whole Cohen Brothers thing is just an excuse for us to have like a, a therapy session about our feelings that we're experiencing through the movie? Probably. Movies. Isn't that what we signed up for? Yeah. <laughs> I feel well, great I after that, every one of these. I feel like a new man. You made me sign the contract, Ian, and you were like, no women. Uh, <laughs> you have to tell me if you cried during the movie. Um... <laughs> no, the, going back to the idea of like the bowling alley being their kind of like place where they can just be themselves and be as horrible as they want to. When they have a conversation like at a local like diner kind of place, right? Mm-hmm. Walter is like almost immediately asked to like shut up very nicely by the female uh, woman who's like running the floor mm-hmm. and uh, to which he takes very badly, of course. And then like uh, like there's all these like background faces of, of groups of people that are do seem to be like equally women and men. And they're all just kind of like especially like the women looking at him are like all horrified by him. And uh, I don't know. I thought that was an interesting uh yeah juxtaposition oh. about how they're just like in reg- polite society they're just like ho- well that horrible. opening sequence where like you know you talked about how it's the tumbleweed part but then it goes into the bowling alley and it's got like the slow motion like it's it's painted as this like weird mecca you know mm-hmm. where it's like fully like slow motion like beautiful colors and like i think roger deakins talks about like how he shot the film to be like incredibly vibrant and beautiful in the dream sequences and in the bowling alley and then like completely drab everywhere else you yeah, know it works which is like it totally works Th- this no, movie has yeah sense. two musical montages like beautiful ones like by the time the opening credits are over uh, yeah. and like I I do feel like I you know you mentioned like in Fargo that that seemed like the culmination of all the kind of like techniques and stuff that they'd honed during the other films I didn't feel that way I felt like Fargo was like the stripped down version where it was just like uh, you know noir kind of story in like a contemporary like uh, Minnesota kind of milieu and that's it that's all you get uh, but then this movie really does feel like it's like it's a western noir contemporary stoner buddy movie uh, with right. musical interludes uh, I think yeah, it's like sequences, uh, they're just like, like they're just like throwing everything in, in together and mashing it all up in this kind of like postmodern way and it, it really feels uh, not only does it like work and it's beautiful but it's like completely unique like um, in, a, in a way that reminds me of um, Raising Arizona actually the way that that mm-hmm. movie is just like totally like kind of um, thrilling and it's like how like masterfully it's kind of conducted but also just like you have this like ridiculous narration that doesn't really kind of make any sense uh, for this for this like uh, southwestern couple and then you have like the like the crime movie and the domestic movie kind of mashed together and then you have like the biker from hell like out of like a post-apocalyptic um, action movie just you know as like an extra ingredient um, sort of almost similar to like the way the cowboy is just sort of like the I guess he's uh, credited as the stranger, the stranger um, yeah. as a total like outside element in this movie and uh, and you just you just get something completely unique and it's really wonderful. It's like and it borderline. It's like a borderline musical in some se- some sequences. It's wonderful. And it's their first time bringing T Bone Burnett on, and he's like, you know, they still have Carter Burwell doing the score, but like they bring in T Bone Burnett to, you know, who's like an old school folk rock guy. Like he did a bunch of Bob Dylan albums with him, and like you know has albums of his own which are great. And he uh, he comes on and he curates the playlist that he thinks is the dude's playlist. That's what we hear in the movie. And that goes to everything from like how most of the music in the movie, even when it's a giant musical set piece, is diegetic. Like, you know, like right. you have this dream sequence where he is, you know, flying through the air to The Man in Me by Bob Dylan. And then like the bowling ball pulls him down and he's like, uh, wakes up and like it fades into his tinny earbuds that mm-hmm. he's actually listening to, you know, and it's right. like really like, I don't know, the way that they used the T-Bone Burnett, the music that he chose and the way that they use it in the movie is so brilliant to me. Like, Mm -hmm. even when it's songs that like, like I, I remember being, you know, how old were we when this came out? 17, 18, something like that. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, I remember like huge Dylan guy still am obviously, but like at the time I was all in on Dylan. (laughs) And, um, I, 
just remember like when that man and me cut kicks in like right early on in the movie. And I'm just like, I fucking love this movie. Like I was just so on board for like that song to be playing in this like vibe. I was just so, and Jeff Bridges, my God, like I, he's sadly like, maybe not sadly. It's great. He's always been great, but like, he's definitely like lost track of where he begins and the dude ends you know, at this point. And he like rarely, you know, he's got a band called Jeff Bridges and the Abiders. Like he really thinks of himself as the dude now. And that's cool for him, whatever, do what you want to do. I don't know if I'd say like a silent film star. I mean, he definitely contorts his face a bit, but he, he feels like he, he can't help but be naturalistic. Like he does some wacky stuff in this movie, but he seems somehow like more grounded and less cartoonish than like every other character. The Tai Chi, Chris is miming for me right now. And then also I'm thinking of, yeah, the dance during the dream sequence. And the, I mean, one part that is like silent comedy when Jackie Treehorn excuses himself and he goes from <laughs> oh like his, like lying down on the couch to like that. bolting up and doing this like <laughs> Pink Panther walk over to the sketchbook <laughs> and then running back and diving back into the most forced relaxed position that part is actually like brilliant. shows it literally like shows his close-up of his face when he sees what jackie Dr- mm-hmm. treehorn had been sketching or doodling or whatever and like his face is just like this very quick but like it's a close-up so it's a you know a yeah. deliberate thing where it's just like a confused grimace that's like befuddled and it's yes. so he's an actor much he's, a, he's a great actor like, he is right? an actor <laughs> he's a great actor but i'm just like, i just mean like you know uh john turturro's performance you could watch silently like john goodman's yeah. performance you could watch silently jeff bridges feels like a little more uh, naturalistic and grounded and uh and the movie's like stronger for it like you know i don't know yeah yeah i agree no, absolutely. Uh, you touched on a couple things. I mean, the soundtrack and the, I was thinking about the drawing and this thing that keeps coming up that I, I didn't really pick up on the before is this over this overemphasis, this theme of masculinity. Like the word man mm-hmm. comes up so many times in this movie in so many different ways. Like, uh, I mean, the, the man in me is a recurring, you know, song that pops yeah, up. Yeah. Hey man, you know, what makes a man, you know, Mr. Lebowski? Well, cut off your shunson. They even have like the, the, yeah, the scissors mm-hmm. and everything. He's the man. He's the man in his time. Time and place. There's a there's a man. There's a man. You know. And sometimes there's a man. Sometimes right. there's a man. <laughs> and like it's just it's this. And then the you know the the ran, seemingly random scene where Jackie Treehorn is drawing this <laughs> giant you know manhood, if you will. Like there's so much of this like idea of masculinity that comes up in this movie that's more so than any other of, of their films. And I'm still well, not except for maybe you know, Miller's Crossing because that's my take on Miller's Crossing is that it's all about like them trying to figure out what makes a man Mm. and like i do think that like this is the second if not right up there with it because i think that like that it's it's that whole thing it ties back into like the american thing to me is that like it's all about like masculinity and money and war and it all is this stuff that like they're like and this isn't I, th- I think uh it's in all their movies too and it's uh yeah. i think this one is like yeah yeah i'll just say that yeah, I definitely read it in this one like a lot more this time that I watched it. And I don't know if it's just because I'm older or whatever it is, but like it was, or because I'm watching all their movies where it's such a constant theme. But like, yeah, it was, uh, I mean, it's not subtle. Like, they're literally talking about cutting off his dick and throwing mm-hmm. a ferret on his fucking Johnson. You know, it's like they're really all about like, you know, he's having a dream sequence where like, fucking Peter Stormari is gonna and Flea are gonna like chop off his dick with giant scissors I mean the dream sequences in this movie we're going all over the place this podcast it's impossible to talk about this movie any other way I feel like any kind of linear fashion and the giant scissors are seen in the painting at Mods did you guys see that no oh I didn't notice there's a painting in Mods life size bright red I mean, life size meaning like a man size, like a six foot tall canvas with like a giant pair of scissors, and the scissors Great. are taken from that painting, and then the red jumpsuits are like oh, from right. the uh, the wash in the painting. I never noticed that. I don't know That's if I noticed it either, but yeah, I saw it last night. Huh. Um, but yeah, these dream sequences. We talk about how the Coens love 
dream sequences and how they're often mm-hmm. meaningful. They're kind of like a reflection of the underlying themes of the movie. But this, these dream sequences, they take it to a whole nother level, especially with the whole musical component to them. Yeah. Uh, such that, like you just mentioned, Travis, I'd seen it how many times and I never even noticed the relationship between the scissors, you know? Mm-hmm. I wonder how many other subtleties are, you know, in there. Because the dream sequence totally. is an extended one, you know? And he does it a couple yes. times, if I remember. But Yeah, there's two. Yeah, yeah. Um, um but, and uh, both times he's gotten knocked out and he's like in like a, you know, drug induced mass, or violence drug induced. induced. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, I mean, the second dream sequence is the like real showstopper to me. Like the first one is like gets you on board with the vibe of the movie. It happens right at the beginning of the movie, really. And like, you know, I fucking loved that. But the second one is just like it's longer and it's fucking really laying out like. I read like the perfect summation of it, which was just like, you get to see like the ultimate Zen, the bowler becomes the bowling ball. Like it's really like all right there, you know? And like, it's also the only time in the movie that you see the dude bowl is in that dream. I was going to say, you never see him like roll the ball. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe he's just no good in real life. Who knows? (laughs) Yeah. I was thinking that too. This is awkward. You know, that, that dream sequence is the highlight of the movie for me. It's like so much fun and so perfect. I love those old Busby Berkeley musicals too. Like I yeah, love that those too. visuals. So like the the checkerboard floor and like just all the mm-hmm. dancers in unison. Those those giant which I hats. think the checkerboard floor was also taken from the Big Lebowski's house. You know, because mm. he had the checkerboard floor oh, yeah. in his house mm-hmm. too. Uh, yeah, I don't know. There's so much in there. Um, we got to talk for a minute about, I guess, about some of the other like tertiary characters like i said like you got philip seymour hoffman giving a fucking incredible performance they must have just i mean the the pornography is a big theme in this movie or a theme in this movie but like uh he must they must have loved boogie nights right or like Mm -hmm. so when what's the difference in time here like a year like this came out like the year after boogie nights yeah, because Julianne Moore is right there too. Yeah, obviously. and I, in my opinion, honestly, Julianne Moore and Philip Seymour Hoffman giving two of the weaker performances in this movie. In fact, Julianne Moore, I don't fully love in this movie, and I'm a big Julianne Moore fan. But I'm a huge Julianne Moore fan too. I think that like she, I wouldn't say I'm like a fan of her in this movie. I think that like she's playing like who. I mean, the way that she talks and like her, you know, weird like. I'll say, like, the reason why I love her scenes just as much as any other scene is because David Thewlis is so <laughs> fucking funny. Like, he's so good in that scene that little with giggle. his giggle. Dude, he's funny. He's funny. I mean, like, Julianne Moore, like, almost makes me laugh a couple times. Like, she's good, but, like, you know, like, honestly, like, someone like Kristen Wiig or something like that, you know, um, you, I imagine the part and, like, yeah. actually making me, like, laugh out loud. And, like, being right. just, like, even more ridiculous, like, at the level of, like, John Goodman or at the level of, like... Yeah, I mean, she's not... I had the same kind of feeling this week watching it, which, like, I was such a huge fan of hers, and still am, you know, but, like, when this movie came out, because it was a year after Biggie Nights, yeah. and that's one of my favorite movies, so I was, like, you know, I was already, like, sold on her, and, like... She's got a small part. Like, she's in two short scenes, really, in this movie, plus the dream sequence, I guess. She's got a small part in Magnolia, but she still kind of, like, knocks you over in that, you know? But uh, Oh, I just mean, like, it didn't, you know, she her her part's small enough that, like, it wasn't going to ruin me. Okay, okay. Or it for me, but, like, I do even remember, like, this week watching it and just being like, yeah, she's the only one. You talk about naturalistic with uh, Jeff Bridges and, like, she's the only one that like feels like anti-naturalistic because even John yeah. Goodman who's always over the top or John Saturo who can go over the top like you buy it from them yeah. because of their characters you know because of who they are mm-hmm. and she just like it feels like a character, a character she's you know? so better than she was on 30 Rock but not I as good as she it. is in Paul Thomas Anderson movies but I guess also like uh, Peter Stormari and Flea and that whole thing is doing the over the top thing in a che- cheesy way too, you know. Peter but Stormari like, works for me. Flea and the others, does. luckily, they barely get to talk because they kind of wreck it a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's funny with you know Philip Seymour Hoffman actually with maybe one of his 
few like straight man roles where he's not like a drug addict or he's upset at somebody or he's totally like a corrupt you know whatever one way or the other so it's kind of funny to see him in a role where he's just kind of in the reserved background the the straight man to the like the big bad you know the guy behind the desk which we love to see i totally yes, disagree yes. with travis i think he was so good in this like i thought that like his laugh his nervous laugh the fact that it was a year after boogie nights where he's got like the same kind of like you know beta role but like is playing it so differently where it's like i don't know i just thought he was so funny in this he like, does every time he laughs he does an amazing so thing good. yeah where like uh about like the dude trips him up so much that he can like barely get out his like pre uh you know like pre-memorized like speech about all like lebowski's accomplishments mm-hmm. and stuff like that <laughs> and then he, he like gets all f- kind of flustered uh i mean it's good i just Sometimes I, I don't know what to make of um, Philip Seymour Hoffman performances when he doesn't have when he's not showing like all his emotions like on his right. skin like those performances well, course, are so great to me. The other character that we haven't even mentioned, I mean I've I've mentioned him, but like we haven't mentioned him as an actor is Tom or not Tom uh, David Huddleston, who plays the Big Lebowski. Yes, right. And like I heard again, this is like reading things on the internet, so who knows if it's true that like he was hired because he looks like Philip Seymour Hoffman and they wanted like it to look like Philip Seymour Hoffman and him were like, it's another cyclical thing yeah, where yeah, like yeah. he's just going to grow into that now. That's you know? hilarious. And like that is really funny because he doesn't like, he's great and it. He's fine. It doesn't stand out to me as like, I wonder what it would be like if that pre- performance was like, by a more powerhouse actor, which like most of this, you know. Oh, weird! I kind of feel like he's. Got... I kind of feel like he's Good. perfect in that role. I kind of feel like he's like one of the ultimate Cohen, like yeah, old huge men behind a desk guys. He's he like that guy. He's like he's he delivers it at like a perfect pitch of like, um, like owning that character of like, what do you want? My time is valuable. Like you know, kind of like an Ebenezer Scrooge yeah. kind of character, but then, but also. He does seem full of shit when he gives that speech and he's like, mm. strong men also cry. Like <laughs> that, it, it, is, that is so funny. And there's something very Cohen's that about that where it's like, the and then he's like, you know, then a pair of testicles. He's like, you joke, but maybe you're right. right. Like he, there's that something about so that funny. where they know, where they know that, that all that, that where the, all that everything he's saying is kind of a put on, you know, but then there's another yeah. layer to it. I mean, it's a put on like in the most obvious sense because he's just making up a story for the dude to manipulate him into to, uh, you know, helping him launder this million dollars that he's trying to embezzle. But then it's also just like the act that these people put on to like, you know, when they to create this their character that they're living in their life, which is like this the great man. Right. Which is like his whole yeah. house is like a, a, a monument to his like how he wants to be that that person. So anyway, I thought well, it, I thought it was like, yeah, and he's, yeah. you know, I mean, I think like to get a little bit deeper into that, like his legacy is so important to him and like you know, the movie ends with talking about like the dude's legacy and how like, you know, what does uh, Sam Elliott say? It's like, um, that's the way the whole human comedy, whatever it is, like uh, keeps perpetuating itself on down the... He's talking about people dying and people being born. Yeah, I don't yeah know that's exactly. Legacy, and it's like, yeah. Well, he says like the dude, there's a little Lebowski coming and like, yeah, Donnie's gone, but there's another Lebowski coming. Like that makes me feel pretty good. And like... I feel like that's like saying that like when I say the dude's legacy, I don't mean specifically like the dude, but like the Zen sort of part of the dude where she's like, this is, this is going to keep going. You know, the dude's like vibe is going to keep on going. Whereas like the big Lebowski's legacy is like his daughter hates him. He doesn't have shit to leave. You know, it's like, he's going to have this money like that he's trying to like steal from his nonprofit organizations and stuff like that. But it's like, you know, it's like, it's what it's more criticism of the uh, you know American machine. I think like is tied up in that. I don't know. I just keep thinking about other guys who played a similar kind of character to the Big Lebowski in the other Cohen films, and I'm, I can't help thinking about like uh, the guy who played Mister Hudsucker. Yes, um, I think that he might have been able to do it as well yeah, too. He comes back uh, in the next one, right? Right? Charles right? Turner. He's the right in, in, in a similar role, right? The the music producer, um, mm-hmm. and uh, also what's his name? Michael. Uh, he was in Barton Fink as the, uh, oh, the Michael Lerner. Yeah, I'm like, what would he might? What would he have brought to the role? You know, 
I wonder, because he's not in this movie himself, but... Uh, and even Albert Finney. You know, Albert Finney, I think, was ooh, like right. at that age, you know, where it's like, you know... Mm-hmm. I mean, we're just picking Coen Brothers people now, but like that's. But they do have of, a type, yeah. Any of those, any of those guys, like you know, yeah. Eeny Meeny Miny Mo. I think they're all, they're all good. Mm-hmm. They all, they right. all do it for me. Uh, who else we got in there? Anything else you guys want to talk about before we like? I mean, any other characters? I just want to. John Polito comes back. My, There's a lot of John like, Polito's perfect. Again, the PI in the Volkswagen Beetle. That specific right. yeah. image is uh, repeated. <laughs> His like, so I don't sweaty. know, like. His, his motion of like putting his arms above his head, like a, like, I don't know, like some sort of like uh, a mongoose or something like that. He seems like he's trying to do like, to like assert his dominance. That is one of the funniest yeah. images in the movie to me. The other is the literal ferret that gets thrown in the bathtub. That whole True. like sequence is so funny when he comes out of the water and he's like all wet. Yeah, That's his, another favorite moment. Marmot. There's a few cameos in there that I've, uh, you know, Amy Mann as the Tolis. Um, you know, he's definitely watching. They are definitely watching. Like, I guess there was like a scene at this time, which was like centered around Largo in L.A., which was like, you know, John Bryan would put on these shows and it would have like comedians and uh, directors and all these people would all were all a huge part of it. And I know Paul Thomas Anderson was a huge part of, he would go there like every week and that's how he got hooked up with Amy Mann, who obviously plays a big part in, uh, Magnolia and at least in terms of doing the music for it. And then, um, Charlie Kaufman is in this movie briefly as one of the people is he? watching. He's one of the people watching, uh, the one man, the landlord's one man show. Oh nice. yeah, <laughs> what? You know? I didn't know, I didn't know <laughs> yeah. that, but that scene yeah, is very yeah. Charlie Kaufman esque. So that's really funny. It, it is, totally, totally is. <laughs> and I just think that like I don't know that they were a part of that Largo scene. I can't, you know, I I've never heard stories about them being a part of that, but like they were witnessing it. Like you said, like they must have loved Big Boogie Nights because that was sort of like the beginning of that scene was centered around like. Paul Thomas Anderson's like crew, you know, and like all those, they were all going to see like the same comedians and seeing like the same musicians and stuff like that. So clearly like they were impressed, I think by that world. Cause Charlie Kaufman was part of that too, I think. And like, I don't know that, that was interesting to me. Just the cameos there with like, they threw Amy Mann in there who was like, you know, she was a famous singer obviously for 30 years, but like she was definitely having a resurgence at this moment with that scene, but like the Paul Thomas Anderson scene. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Speaking of Paul Thomas Anderson, you mentioned inherent vice and, uh, yeah, I saw inherent vice way late. I forget how much later after the big Lebowski inherent vice came out. It's like 2004 or something. Maybe 14. it just came out. Oh, 19. Really? It's late. 14. It's late. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. The book, way came out later. Two, the book came out around then. The book came okay. out in like 2009, I think. And then the movie came out in 2014. Ah, uh, okay, okay. But yeah, it's interesting. I mean, there's there's a lot of similarities there, obviously, with, you know, like the stoner guy who was uncovering the, you know, the facts and searching for the missing woman and whatnot. But there's also just a whole lot of very, very different uh, elements there, obviously. Like I said, he's actually actively searching for this thing, and the dude just wants to be left alone, right? Like, he's just, yeah. just leave me alone. I just want to be in peace and, and roll. That's it. That's all I want to do. Mm-hmm. But you just keep throwing me into this this crazy world, you know? But yeah, you yep. can see how Paul Thomas Anderson like loves so much about the Coen Brothers movies, including the cast and certain yeah. plot elements. It's def- definitely there. You know, Paul Thomas Anderson is also a big Robert Altman fan. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. you know, a you know, I just kind of recently watched The Long Goodbye, and I, mm-hmm. uh, I, it never hit me how big an influence that is on this movie, on uh, The Big Lebowski. And, um, you know, like I said, I feel like kind of the way they create their stories by kind of like cribbing them from like, you know, noirs and stuff like that and, and novels and stuff like that, putting them together that way and kind of mashing together different tropes and characters and stuff like that. Um, this movie is sort of like the logical extreme version of that mm-hmm. s- like style. And then I feel like the character of the dude is like the logical uh, extreme of like, a mo- you know, a, a character like um, Marlowe in The Long Goodbye, where he's just kind of like, mm-hmm. um, g- you know, going where he's being led. He's sort of this like existential figure who doesn't have like, um, yeah, he's just trying to get by and just trying to like kind of solve things as they come to him and just kind of... Uh, I don't know, blowing yeah. with the wind a little bit. Like this character, like, yeah, literally doesn't want to solve anything, doesn't really care. Um, well, yeah. and we get like their, 
you know, Chandler like thing right away in Blood Simple. Like it's they that they've been doing the Chandler thing all along. And I felt like watching this uh this week of just like being so impressed with Blood Simple again about how like formed I know we talked about it on that episode, but like how formed they came out the gate because literally like the opening monologue in this scene, I mean in this movie, where Sam Elliott says things that like is the optimistic version of what um uh M. Emmett Walsh says in the opening monologue of that movie. Like it's literally like opens with like a southern drawled or a you know a western drawled narrator, which is not what most uh, film noir things do, which right. is like the detective would be the narrator, but this mm-hmm. is like an outside influence narrator that's just saying like, he literally says in this movie, I ain't never been to London and I ain't never seen France or the queen in her darn dundies or whatever he says, mm-hmm. you know? And it's like, that's like not that much different than Emma Mitt Walsh's character in Blood Simple being like, now, I don't know how they do things over in Russia. Right. You know what I mean? But it's like, they really are just like, they came out of the gate in that movie, just like still able to do. And I guess that plays back into what you were saying about how this movie really is like the culmination of everything that they've done so far. I agree with you. Like, yeah. I said that on the Fargo one, but like watching this one, I'm like, oh, they're doing it again. And even more so because mm-hmm. like, you know, that whole thing of them like exploring cyc- cyclical nature of things and like, the uh you know the rolling on down the fucking line Mm -hmm. nature of the world is just like it's all in this and it's in most of their movies totally absolutely guys do you guys have a a particular ranking in mind now i have a new ranking oh i'm intrigued obviously because it's in this but yeah i don't have (laughs) rank them first (laughs) what you got ian (laughs) after all of this gushing I'm still going to put Fargo at number one because I think it's just like, I think it's just a better movie to me, even though this is more fun uh, to watch probably at parts. But I'm going to go Fargo, uh, Big Lebowski. I'm going to go ahead and put Miller's Crossing back above Raising Arizona. So Miller's Crossing, Raising Arizona. And then... uh, Blood Simple, Barton Fink, Hudsucker Proxy. Fair enough. What about you, Chris? Yeah, I've got it's it's like a dead heat between Fargo and Big Lebowski. I kept going back and forth. I mean, Fargo, I want to put it right up there. I just I I can put on the Big Lebowski at almost any time. So like almost like exactly what you said, Ian. Fargo is probably their better their best movie. Like overall, just best movie, but Big Lebowski is just so enjoyable, so entertaining. So it's pretty much a dead heat, maybe with Fargo having a slight edge. And then followed by Blood Simple, Love Blood Simple, Raising Arizona, Hudsucker Proxy, then Miller's Crossing, then Barton Fink for me. I like that ranking. Wait, wait. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you got it. I like that ranking. You know, I really related to the Big Lebowski this time. Watching the dude, there's multiple points of this movie where he's trying to explain himself and he, like, can't get a sentence out. He's just, like, stuttering and, like, saying like, you know, and, like, kind of, like, not, not <laughs> even, not able to, like, clearly express himself and just kind of, like, I related to that very strongly. Having listened to some of these recordings we've been making, I was like, oh, he's like, <laughs> this is like me when I record the podcast. Um, well, and he does like do that thing, you know, we've talked about it in other episodes that they love to do, but like nobody does it as much as the dude where he just repeats other lines from other, from earlier in the movie, you know, right. like it just keeps coming back. The only time he can get yeah. a thought out is when he like just steals it from something someone when said just, in the last has scene. just heard yeah. something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's really good. It is good. Um, so, related to that I still yeah I mean so my ranking I guess it really is more like t- a tiered ranking you know like my top three are very like very easily um the Big Lebowski Fargo and Raising Arizona um maybe it's Raising Arizona is a hair above Fargo which is maybe a hair above um the Big Lebowski yeah the stuff with Maud kind of just leaves me like a little bit cold but almost everything else is just like perfection to me um Blood Simple is right below that. And then the lowest tier is, um, you know, Hudsucker Proxy, Miller's Crossing, and Barton Fink, all of which are kind of incredible in their own right, but but pretty, uh, can be, can feel a little tiresome. 
If I could just say one yeah. thing, though, about, you know, watching these films, I spent a lot of time on um, social media, Twitter, Instagram, and stuff like that, and I like, you know, hearing people's thoughts on films and stuff like that, and, and um, you know, reading different critics that I, like, stumble upon there, and right now, the vast majority of like all di- film discourse <laughs> is about a re-edit of a shitty superhero movie from like t- two years ago. Uh, it's it's inescapable, and it's such a clear mm-hmm. indictment of what I've been saying, which is like the horrible state of movies today. And I I've never felt more like I'm looking at a naked emperor and just like yeah. watching every single person i respect and admire be like (laughs) these clothes are incredible (laughs) like uh it sucked all the oxygen out of any kind of like other movie discourse right now and it's like so depressing to me and i i I keep feeling like if it was the 90s Zack snyder would be like a lower tier music video director and uh Maybe like he'd direct some cool like Hyundai commercials with the camera like swooping around and stuff like <laughs> that. But the, like, wait a second, <laughs> Jeff Bridges did the commercials for Hyundai. Wow, that must have subliminally <laughs> slipped in there somehow. But my point is, he's like a car commercial director. Like he has no storytelling ability, and all these people are literally like people I follow on Twitter are literally like, it's so cool just to do a dumb movie. Like like somehow like because it doesn't have like people quipping in it like Marvel movies that it's somehow better like when you have like Ben Affleck the most like mediocre actor like of his generation like teamed up with <laughs> Henry Cavill just like a lump of just like, like non charisma like look great <laughs> oh my god and then like even like Amy he like Zack Snyder can't get a good performance from like Amy Adams who's like writer you know maybe well. like the She's best working there. actress and yeah. they're treating like this director's cut like it's like the equivalent of like uh like Terry Gilliam's Brazil. Like if he had to fight to get this made when it's just longer, it's just longer and dumber. That's all it is. And people are like comparing, you know, I, I, I'm a big uh, Christopher Nolan fan, but like, I totally understand like people's different takes on him. And like, there's plenty to criticize with him, but we had, and I like pop culture cinema. I'm not like a snob. You know what I mean? I think it, I think it's incredible that we had like the director of Memento and like the star of like Empire of the Sun and like American Psycho do a Batman movie. That was really cool. Yeah. And and but even just since then, in ten years, cinema culture has devolved to the point where we're all looking at this like disgusting looking CGI like video game cutscene looking piece of gar like four hour long crap <laughs> the worst part and talking about it, about it nonstop. I'm so on with you. The worst part about it is like I'm, uh, somebody like uh, <laughs> Martin Scorsese can come on and be like yeah, you know, that's like a roller coaster movie. Like it's not it's it's not art, you know? And literally the world is like cancel Martin Scorsese <laughs> It's so my. It's just insane. It's just like I'm just so glad I have this excuse to like have to watch like actually good movies and like so I don't get sucked into that insanity because like there were literally a couple times where I was like, I'm gonna have to watch this movie. I'm gonna have to watch the Snyder cut just so I can know how terrible it is and like have Mm -hmm. some like be able to hold on to my sanity. But just like unplugging from that, stepping away and like watching the Big Lebowski and like writing down my thoughts on it like really honestly kept me sane this week. So, Ian, well, whatever psychological kind of, like, healing you're trying to do, I don't care. Just, like, as long as I get to watch these movies, like, thank you for having me. <laughs> you're welcome. Amen, brother. Well, amen. The Travis Absolutely. Abides. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, for that trio, uh, I call Donnie. I can see that. I guess that makes me Walter. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Am I the right. dude by default? All right, yeah. guys. Yeah. Dude by default. I like that. So next uh, week, next we've week had we're a... talking Oh Brother Where Art Thou Yahtzee which, uh, All right, can't it's wait It's going to be a fun one to talk about Always a pleasure All guys right. Until we meet again <laughs> Bye <laughs> Bye <laughs> What the fuck is with this guy? Who is he? Thank you for listening to Autour Detour We'll see you again next week Next week